All right, a lot to get to on the football front today. John Wildhack announcing Dino Babers is back for his seventh season and coming back for the 2022 season. The good news is Sterling Gilbert is out, so we'll break that down, <laughs> plus some other staff changes. A full football episode after the Pittsburgh loss, and the season is fully in the rearview mirror. We've got lots to discuss on the offseason front. It's all coming up on the Locked on Syracuse podcast. <laughs> Locked on Syracuse, your daily podcast on the Syracuse Orange, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in. Thank you for making Locked On Syracuse your first listen every single weekday here with you guys Monday through Friday on the show. And today's episode is brought to you by NetSuite. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system to power your growth. Head to netsuite.com slash locked on NCAA for special end of the year financial financing on the number one financial system for growing businesses. Tim Leonard, Tyler Aki, we're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Also, you can check us out and watch each and every episode on YouTube. And Ty, the uh, football season has come and gone amazingly. What a season it was. Basketball. Got us to basketball, right? Like, yeah, I guess. Enough. I guess it kind of got us I don't us know if basketball. basketball is doing much to, to get us to lacrosse, but <laughs> that's a whole nother topic. We'll talk basketball this week. We'll get you guys ready for Indiana on next on the t- show tomorrow. But gosh, it, a topsy-turvy season that started with us thinking maybe Tommy DeVito and Taj Harris were going to lead the Orange by about week five. They were not with the program. They win five games, but they had two bad three-game losing streaks in there. And John Wildex says Dino Babers is coming back here for year seven, which I know you're really fired up about. I kind of totally expected this to happen. I think yeah. you did too. Like there yes. was never mm-hmm. any doubt, but I'm not like devastated by the news or anything like that. And we can get into it, but I'll give you the floor here because I know this is bugging you. So, I mean, obviously we all kind of expected Dino back. And the second he started playing assistant coach chess with some of the moves that we saw yesterday, you knew he was coming back. The second you start tinkering with the staff, you know your job's in hand and you're you're coming back for another season. The frustrating part is that it's disheartening because by coming out and saying that this uh, decision to bring back Dino Babers has nothing to do with his buyout number, just shows you don't care about Well, that's a flat-out lie, right? It's a flat-out lie. So you're either lying or you don't care about winning. One of the two, okay? And... I, again, that number has been rumored between the the five and a half to to ten million dollar range. Probably settles somewhere in the middle there at about seven and a half or so. But it's just an absolute disgrace that someone is being given a seventh opportunity, a seventh bite at this apple right here. Because th- through his first six years, he is twenty nine and forty three. All right, and you know what? For the purpose of this exercise, and since the sample size is overwhelmingly sizable enough now. Let's throw out the best year. Let's throw out the worst year because that's sometimes the best way to gauge someone's overall performance here. We do this with with running backs, quarterbacks, whatever. Let's do it with the head coach. You throw out the 10 and 3 year, you throw out the 1 and 10 year. Your record then is still 18 and 30. You're 15 and 35 overall in the ACC. You've got one season better than two and six in the conference. That's laughable that you're being given a seventh chance at this thing. Yeah. But again, it's, it's a unique situation with Dino Babers because it's almost like he's on his second contract. And I think the way John Wildhack is viewing it is what has he done in the last three years? And it's like, he started from that point after the 10 win season. And to go out there, like I saw you were tweeting some stuff where it's comparing his numbers to Greg Robinson. I get it, but also you can't compare this guy to Greg Robinson. Like Listen, there's he's no not Greg Robinson. He's not Greg Robinson, but he's got more six conference loss seasons than Greg Robinson now at this point. Yeah, and but me, that was Big East with less games, right? I mean, it's kind one of less cherry game. picking there. One less game. It's not even cherry picking because the fact listen, both can be true. Both of these coaches can be bad. Greg Robinson, obviously a terrible coach. He His ass was sent out the door, right? Dino should not be the head coach of this football team anymore. The amount of times that you saw in-game things come to a boil and, and just get completely, bl- just blow up this team's momentum. 
absolutely blow. There is zero excuse for being at a five and four crux and not getting to a bowl game without any significant injuries at the quarterback position. There, there's just no excuse. For, for this to happen, to look woefully unprepared every single game after the bye week, every single game, it, it's embarrassing. And the fact that you're getting another opportunity is laughable. It shows no commitment to winning in the program. Look at some of these other coaches that are getting fired. All right. Clay Helton, 46 and 24 at USC. Yeah. They're paying well, we're a gonna $10 compare million to USD. Buyout. I mean, that's Listen, just, I'm you can't not saying, do that. But you have to show some commitment to winning. These are programs that have commitment to winning right here. And these are ones that you just got to show a shred of commitment to winning. And to bring a coach back for a seventh season with a 29 and 43 record, that, that to me, in one bowl appearance, is laughable. Let's look at some other coaches here. Ed Ogeron's out, 51 and 21, a national championship. They're going to pay him $17 million to not coach football. Again, this just I don't, 17 I don't, million. I mean, maybe Fine. if you well, want to compare to others? ACC peers, but How about this? not those schools. Justin yeah. Fuente. 43 and 31. They're going to pay him $10 million to not coach football. 10 million. Jimmy Lake at Washington, seven and six. Didn't even really get a full season to coach. They're going well, to pay him also, like, 9.9 million. Situation with this player. I mean, but they're so not, that, but here's the thing that they're not firing him with cause. So, well, yeah, by, by saying mean, that he had the situation with this player, that's not the reason they fired him. They're paying it, him nine point nine million dollars to it not coach. To it. He's at Washington. Nine point nine million dollars to not coach. There's no commitment to winning at this program, and it's disgusting. So I think what this comes down to, this whole conversation, is: Do you think that Dino Babers can take this team to a bowl game next year? Because I'm on the camp that no matter how you look at it, like they did exceed expectations this year. Like you'll even admit that, right? Like they, five they wins certainly is exceeding. Did. They exceeded expectations with the five wins. But once you get in season, expectations change. And the changed expectations, they did not exceed. Well, the reason the expectations changed, though, is because Dino made the gutsy call to go to Garrett Trader, partially. And but how much better Sean did Tucker, things get? I mean, I think they wouldn't have won five games with Tommy DeVito. I think we can confidently say that. At least I can. I'm not going to say it with complete confidence because there are some games you needed to throw the football. But I think there were certain situations where Garrett Trader was better suited as quarterback, certain situations where Tommy DeVito was better suited at quarterback. You look at the, the final stretch of games, and you even saw Garrett Trader fall into the trap that we saw Tommy DeVito fall into, taking some bad sacks. It, it's, again, it was obviously... Five wins. If you told us at the beginning of the season, will you take five wins? Yeah. But the fashion that you got to five wins and kind of the disappointment that you felt at the end, it, it almost begs the question, like, did the final three games sour all the goodwill that you had in the first nine? And to me, the answer is yes. Right. So do you think they could make a bowl game next year? Not with Garrett Schrader at quarterback. Unless he has improved, even his with Sterling abilities. Gilbert out, I mean, I think that was so much of the issue is that if you get the right offensive coordinator in there, you've got the defensive team, you've got the young pieces coming back. You keep Sean Tucker. That's the other thing we're going to get into in this conversation mm -hmm. here. Is by firing Dino, you're also probably losing Sean Tucker. He basically said as much, and I get it. Like it's one player, but he's such an important piece to what you want to do in the future. And I feel like if you fire Dino now. In the market that the coaching market is right now, there's not a lot of great options. There's just so many schools out there looking for a coach that I'm not saying they shouldn't have fired Dino. They probably should have fired him a long time ago. And I get it. It's showing a lack of a commitment to winning, but you're in for a big rebuild if you fire him right now. And I also think there's a decent chance this team's projected probably to win five or six games next year by him coming back and Sean Tucker coming back. But do you look at it this way, okay? If he doesn't get this team to a bowl next year, you're just prolonging this. L look at, I mean, look at this rec upcoming recruiting class right now for Syracuse. You've got 10 guys signed, and National Signing Day is right around the corner. The, the recruiting classes are usually, you're in the 20 to 22 neighborhood at this point. These recruits are looking at this program and saying, that guy's probably not going to be my head coach by the time I graduate or go to the NFL. So there's a lot of cloud surrounding this program right now. And I think the sooner you tear things down, the better it is. Because, I mean, look at someone like Jeff Halfley, okay, at, at Boston College. Look how quickly he turned around recruiting. 
at that program. And you can say, oh, Boston College underperformed this year. They had a quarterback injury. But look at the momentum behind the program as a whole right now when you take the bird's eye view of it. The recruiting is getting better. They're doing better than Syracuse in pretty much every facet. And they're recruiting in the same neighborhoods as Syracuse. That's the problem right now, is if you get the right guy in there, you can fix this thing in two to three years. But if you don't have that right guy in there, then you just continue to push this thing down the road, and who knows what your coaching market's going to look like then. Well, we know this year it's not a good coaching market, and we know that they have a chance to make a bowl game next year, and if they fire him now, you're losing Sean Tucker. And I do think that's a big deal. We tweeted out the poll would you rather have if you just only had these two options, Dino fired and Tucker gone, or Dino and Tucker both back? Right now, 68% are in favor of Dino and Tucker both back. It's an intri- intriguing question. Yeah, very intriguing. It's one I- I've thought about a lot. It's tough mm-hmm. to – I'm not, like, fully on one side versus the other because it, there's a give and a take there for both. But I do think if – the offensive coordinator hire is now a huge deal, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. That, to me, is where it becomes, all right, if you get in the right offensive coordinator that hopefully can develop Schrader a little bit, and you make a bowl game next year, you at least are on to something with some momentum with Sean Tucker here. If you fire Dino now, I would say it's two, three years before you're sniffing a bowl game, which well, I get that's that's the short-term look at it, and we have to be looking long-term, but... To me, why not just wait one more year almost and say bowl game or bust next year? They improved by four wins this year, and then you're keeping Sean Tucker. You're keeping what you have. You're in a really tough spot, I think, if you fire Dino now. But I don't think it puts you in a tough spot. Listen, you're going to take your lumps at some point, right? Whether you fire him next year or you fire him this year, I'd rather expedite the process and get it over with and try to reboot this thing as quickly as possible. Plus, I look at, okay, the Sean Tucker thing. He could be gone next year. Like, like. There, there's no guaranteeing that he's staying for a senior season. He's one of the best running backs in the country right now. You don't think he's going to, he doesn't have the NFL on his mind. He could go to the league. He could go be a fourth round pick in the NFL and, and go, cause that's the, the going right now for running backs is you can kind of find them anywhere. And even if you're an undrafted free, I mean, look, look at this past weekend, the, the Titans ran out two practice squad guys and, and looked phenomenal on the ground. Like you don't have to be some stellar back to make it in the NFL. You just got to get your one crack at it and and impress. So Sean Tucker may look at it that way. There's no guarantee Sean Tucker is going to be around much more than one year. And that to me is the biggest problem with, with this idea of don't bring back Dino or bring back Dino because it'll bring back Sean Tucker. I just think that's a foolish exercise because you should have commitment to coaching and infrastructure at the collegiate level. This isn't the NFL where you've got guys that are going to change your, your franchise for 10, 12 years. Sean Tucker could be out in three and he had a, he's having a great Syracuse career. He's going to go down as one of, if not the greatest running back Syracuse has ever had. Like, like let's not get it right. cloudy or twisted here. Like he is going to Probably go down. Not. As I one mean, of, they've had a lot of great ones, but he's but going to go down as saying. one of the best that they have ever had. And he is certainly someone who's changing the momentum of your program, hopefully. But at the end of the day, you have to have commitment to infrastructure, not players at the collegiate level in terms of if you are going to build up a successful program. So if you're not going to get rid of Dino because it comes at the cost of Sean Tucker, I think you're making a big mistake there. Because guess what? Sean Tucker also plays the running back position. Those things are a dime a dozen. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, college football fanatics, have you heard about Prize Picks? Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. I love it. I know you guys will as well. They are the leader in college sports daily fantasy right now, and they offer more college football props than anyone in the world. Be a great weekend coming up with the championship games, ACC, SEC, all those big games with college football playoff implications. They're going to have tons of different prize picks options out there, tons of different props from yardage to touchdowns, even interceptions thrown. You can find it on prizepicks.com. And all of our new users that deposit and use the promo code locked on will receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100. Just be sure to use promo code locked on. You pick two to five players on an over under on their projections. You can win up to 10 times on any entry. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. Use the award-winning app on both the App Store and Google Play. Don't hesitate. Check out prizepicks.com and use that promo code Locked On, or go to your App Store and download the app today. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. 
So Sterling Gilbert's out. That's like I joked about at the beginning. The good news here. I felt like Johnny Drama. I was shouting victory after this happened. <laughs> I mean, this, this was... I think we were the first ones on this, too. I, I think we probably said this right around when Schrader took over as, as the starting quarterbacks. So what was that, week four, week five of the season? We, I, I want to say we were the first ones on. Get, get Sterling out of town. He's, he's one of the bigger problems here. Yeah, and I didn't know if Dino was going to necessarily do it. I think what changed here in the last three weeks is it was pretty obvious that he had no adjustments to be made. And he went up against better defenses that it had game film on Syracuse. And I don't know. I mean, he had a good game plan and scripting for the first drive against Pittsburgh. And we actually threw in a trick play and some different stuff here or there in that game at the start. But then it was more of the same. And it's amazing how much teams are stacking the box against Syracuse, as they should be. Pittsburgh had their safeties up basically right behind the defensive linemen in, in certain instances. Yeah. And it felt like they were doing everything they could. So then Sean Tucker's out of the game. You can't even get one of our best running backs in program history. Did you involved. see the pit tweet, by the way? I, I, I got to say, yeah. this was pretty brilliant. Held the, one of the nation's best rucker, rushers to 29 yards. We are pleased with our performance. Yeah. I, I thought that was actually some, some really good, a, a little smack. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Yeah. yeah. And just, I mean, people of them were talking about. At least about, they get the bit. At least they get right. the bit. And it's become more of a thing that the, as the years progress, like Sean Tucker his Twitter is not just a local Syracuse thing anymore, which yeah. is kind of cool. But yeah, so the thing with Gilbert that really bugged me is when defenses learned the offense and film was out there and the newness and the novelty weared off, it was pretty clear he had no other options here. And now you make the right move. And this is, I mean, this is it for Dino. He has to right. find the right offensive coordinator here. He found the right defensive coordinator with Tony White, which is also good news that that was announced that he is coming back. I was pretty worried that he was going to get poached by someone else. I think there was a decent yeah. shot of that. He's coming back. Mike Schmidt is coming back. And you got rid of the guy that you really need to get rid of, which was Sterling Gilbert. I look at this hire, though. This is a, almost an unfair slash impossible hire to make if you're Dino Babers. Because you know that your job status is tied to Dino Babers. And if he's only going to be around one year, you have... Literally, you probably have like nine games to figure this thing out and get it right if you're the offensive coordinator for this team. Because if you don't do it in the first nine games, then your job is you're out the door too because they're not keeping anyone around. They're, they're, they're just going to clean house. So you're essentially signing a one-year contract, a one-year prove-it deal as an offensive coordinator. You're probably looking at some younger guy who's looking to take some significant career leap. I don't think you're going to get the best guy for this job. And that's the thing that worries me. Well, the name that's been brought up already is the Kent State yeah. offensive coordinator, Andrew Souter. He knows Dino. He played for Dino. Yep. Uh, at least he was a wide receiver at Baylor. Was when with Dino, Dino was the wide receiver Green. coach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then Eastern Illinois. So he was the wide receiver coach there. I don't know how much experience he has developing quarterbacks, which I think that's the biggest concern for me, at least, is let's get yeah. an offensive coordinator that can sort of teach Schrader how to throw a little bit better. And mm -hmm. if it's not Schrader, convince a transfer portal guy to come in that's better than Schrader to compete and just beef up the quarterback room as a whole. And one positive from John Wildhack's press conference is he said, we've talked about him and Dino, someone who's worked and developed quarterbacks filling that role, which is good to hear. Right. So I look at Souter, and obviously he's got the experience there. Kent State has a, and again, Kent State, Sean Lewis, guy who really made this offense click, and you talk to a lot of people, and he's kind of the guy that made this thing go. You'd love to have Sean Lewis back on this staff to, to kind of pioneer this offense and get this thing back on the tracks, but you look at some of these Kent State offensive numbers here. They're unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, they are good. <laughs> third best rushing attack in the entire country. Eighth best total offense. 30th in scoring offense. And guess what? They run the ball less than Syracuse and have the third best rushing offense in the country. I get you're going up against the Mac. You have those funky Tuesday games, but they put up points. They run the ball effectively. It's a little bit of a different sort of um, identity than what we saw when, when Sean Lewis was the offensive coordinator here. But to me, that says adaptability, knowing your personnel and playing to their strengths. And you've got really good, a really good rushing attack at Kent State. So what are you going to do? You're going to run the ball. And you're going to have a lot of success with it, but you're also going to be able to sprinkle in a little bit of the passing game as well to exploit those defenses. And to me, 
listen, if Andrew Souders the guy, makes a lot of sense. I, Sean Lewis, it seems it like, makes is the so guy that, much sense. Yeah, and, and, and Sean I don't know Lewis, how it, it seems like, is the guy that made it, this though. thing go. Right. I mean, I think he's qualified. It makes sense. I almost would like to see Dino step outside of his comfort zone and and don't hire a friend or someone that he's worked with and knows in the past. But that's probably not going to happen here. Given if he that, had three years, if you could somewhat quasi guarantee him three years or even like two years with a chance at the third, I think that he would maybe venture off. But when you've got one year to get things right, you got to go with what you know. You, you right. like you have to. And listen. This isn't to say Dino's offense has not worked. We've seen it work. It worked the first three years he was here, all right? But a lot of that was led by Sean Lewis, and so maybe you get someone who's kind of been Sean Lewis's right-hand man because it worked with him, but when you kind of strayed, even though it was guys that you quote-unquote sort of knew, you kind of strayed from what really worked at Bowling Green and at Syracuse those first couple years. So maybe go back to a guy who kind of knows how the thing works. Yeah, and that's the argument for Dino, I guess, is you haven't ever matched up the coordinators. So you had yeah. Brian Ward when you had Sean Lewis. You had one bad, one good. Now you had Tony White when you had Sterling Gilbert. Maybe you get Tony White and the good offensive coordinator, and all of a sudden you can piece together a season that is going to surprise some people and figure out Garrett Schrader's throwing a little bit more. And if you, if you unlock that to an extent that, you hope that he, I mean, he's got to improve somewhat. Now, maybe it's not Garrett Trader. Maybe someone else comes in or competes for the job. And it's going to be interesting. Like, this transfer portal thing is going to be a real thing this yeah. year. It's going to be like college basketball last year, I think. And we can right. get into that because it, over the course of the week, I think we're going to see more and more names. Right now, Syracuse has had 10 players enter the portal. Joe Rendoni entered uh, today, according to Stephen Bailey, which the defensive line's in a tough spot. And we'll talk about Vincent Reynolds in just a second. but. In terms of Gilbert and the offensive coordinator hire, this is incredibly important. You're probably right. I wouldn't be shocked if it's Souter. That doesn't excite me a ton, but at least there is some Sean Lewis connection there. There's some reason to believe, based on the numbers he's put up at Kent State, that he's a much better option than Sterling Gilbert. And to me, last year was more on Gilbert than Dino, which I guess yep. I hesitate to say that because Dino hired Gilbert, right? And I know people are saying yeah. that mm -hmm. when they're hearing that, but... If we're taking that out of the equation, I think Dino can succeed if he has the right offensive coordinator. He definitely didn't have the right offensive coordinator last year. So maybe if you hire the right guy, there's reason to believe that they improve on last year. I'm with you. Listen, last last season, I blame Gilbert mostly, but you, you also have to put a little bit of that blame on Dino's plate as well because he's the one that made the hire. He's the one that's responsible for some of the in-game stuff. He He's an offensive-minded head coach. So when the offense struggles to the degree it did down the stretch and you can't throw the football, it falls on Dino as well. I look at it this way, too, and I, I saw this. So the, the Souter speculation came from Q's Confidential, um, and, and I think it's a very well-educated one, too. But one of the other things that's been floated out and about is that I don't want to see someone come in to be the offensive coordinator slash quarterbacks coach. And to me, I think that's, that's a little off-rooted there. Because you look at some of the best programs in the country, they're tying their offensive coordinator to the quarterback position. And I think that's the right thing to do because at the end of the day, the most important position on the field is your quarterback. Why would you not want the guy who's the offensive guru, the guy who's crafting the game plan, who's making all the play calls, why would you not want that guy directly in contact with your quarterback every single second of every single practice? To me, I think that's a good thing. Um, you look at the best programs in the country, Alabama does it, Georgia does it. Y even you look in the ACC, the best programs in the country do that. I think you do need to do that. I don't think it's a big deal to get an offensive coordinator who's who, like people want an offensive coordinator and then a quarterback coach. I think if you can't coach quarterbacks, you probably shouldn't be the offensive coordinator at the end of the yeah. day. Right, and I guess that's my concern with Souter is it seems like he's more wide receiver background based, and he's never been. I mean, he was a wide receiver coach for Dino. He played wide receiver, so without doing a ton of research on him, it seems like right now he doesn't exactly fit that mold of what John Wildhack was discussing with Dino and saying, we want that guy that can develop our quarterbacks. 
Right, which is a fair, it's a fair counterpoint. Again, at the end of the day, quarterback development is the most important thing. Because if this team could have thrown the ball last year, there's no doubt in my mind they're going to a bowl game. I mean, all yeah. those toss-up 50-50 games are Syracuse wins. All of them. All of, if you can throw the ball with a shred of success, you win, what, seven, eight games last season? Right? Yeah, Somewhere probably. in that neighborhood. All right, so we're going to get into the other staff changes in just a little bit, or the other staff firings, I guess I should say. But this is it, the putt to win the tournament. If you sink it, the championship is yours. But on your backswing, your hat falls over your eyes. Is this how you're running your business? Poor visibility because you're still relying on spreadsheets and outdated finance software. To see the full picture, you need to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system to power your growth with visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, and more. NetSuite is everything you need to grow all in one place. 93% of surveyed businesses increase their visit visibility and control after upgrading to NetSuite. Over 27,000 businesses already use NetSuite, and right now, through the end of the year, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind financing program to those ready to upgrade at netsuite.com slash locked on NCAA head to netsuite.com slash locked on NCAA for special end of the year financing on the number one financial system for growing businesses netsuite.com slash locked on NCAA it is here the best Monday of the year cyber Monday and built.com is the place to aim your mouse get at least 20% off everything delicious and healthy that's 20% off site wide and even bigger discounts on built boost broth and built swag a brand new built bar flavor has also landed just in time for cyber Monday go check out the caramel almond delight I haven't tried that one but Certainly sounds like something I may be doing later on today. And delivers everything it promises. Caramelized chocolate check, almonds check, delightful double check. Be sure to get yours before they're gone. They only have 150 calories and 17 grams of protein. And this season, maybe you're craving white chocolate. So for a limited time, get a special new Built Bar Puffs flavor, white chocolate cheesecake. The yummy protein-filled treat with marshmallowy center covered in white chocolate. Tim, you and I love the Built Bar Puffs. Nothing yes, better than the Built so Bar good. Puffs. 140 calories, 17 grams of protein. Tis the season to save and give your taste buds the gift of Built Bar. Get to Built.com for these incredible tasting new bars and 20% off everything. So head over to Built.com, enter the code LOCK20 before it's too late. Again, Built.com, code LOCKED20. All right, so the other cut you moves that were announced, Vincent Reynolds is out as the defensive line coach, and Reno Faree is out as the tight end coach, two guys that came with Dino in 2016. A little surprised by the defensive line announcement yeah. of Vincent Reynolds mm -hmm. because, one, they have very limited guys coming back at that position, and so they have six returning scholarship defensive linemen right now. That is a huge concern as we look ahead to the offseason, the portal, all that mess. Caleb Okachukwu, Steve Linton, Terry Lockett are really the only guys that you have any sort of confidence in. I guess Darden played a little bit as a walk-on, but you also only have one D-line commit right now. You've had two decent D-line commits decommit in recent sort of weeks or so, and Curtis Harper's out, Joe Rondoni's out, as I mentioned earlier. So the defensive line is right up there, I'd say, with wide receiver and – even quarterback, you could argue, in terms of priorities for this offseason moving forward. I guess part of the reason probably why Vincent Reynolds is out the door is because he wasn't a 3-3-5 guy, and now you're probably leaning more into that system as you should be, but I was sort of surprised mm -hmm. by that. It, it was – but I mean, both of them were kind of odd. Did you see uh, Trill Williams' father's tweet, by the way? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. This was, and I think it's a great point too, and kind of shows you what what kind of the faith and the the coaching staff is from the outside world. And, and there were a number of alums of the program as well that were tweeting down on, on some of these coaching moves. But his his whole premise of, of the tweet was, "This is like," and this is in regard to Reynolds and and Reno Ferry getting fired. But this is like complaining about the food at a restaurant and firing the cashier who accepted the money. At the end of the day, it's the chef that, that screwed the whole thing up. And, and to me, I mean, the defensive line's been pretty good the last couple of years. The, the yeah, numbers are there to back it up. I think but more tight ends, because, it's like, yeah, what are you going to fire developing. the tight end coach for? They, they well, weren't given the ball. 
Like I think the the argument there though is like Luke Benson's still dropping passes. They haven't really developed those tight ends as much as you'd like. And they've actually recruited pretty well at that position compared to other positions. And even like Ravion Pierce, he had some nice things in that season, but it's not like they've really unlocked the tight end, which is partially on the offensive coordinator and Dino, but also Luke Benson was still dropping passes late in the season. I will like it say feels this, like he's still something that went really under the radar this year. Max Mang's blocking. He was phenomenal all season long, all season long with some of the ways that he set up some running plays, some of his crack. Play. I mean, Max Mang, that's a guy that I want on my roster. And yeah, but I think then it goes to like, you just have one way options there. Luke Benson. Yeah. He's that's the fine. Like, pass catching guy. You got to develop that, his blocking more. Max Mang. All right. If he's going to be a full tight end, then the tight end coach's job is to develop his catching a little bit more. Yeah, I get that. And again, the way that the tight end position sort of is in the NFL, I think kind of skews what it should be in, in the college game. You don't necessarily need the two way guy per se. It's good to have one of each. I think one guy that can go out, run some routes for you, maybe split them out in the slot a little bit. Another guy that specializes in running situations and blocking and bringing in that extra tight end for pass blocking situations. I think that it's good to have that sort of versatility in your tight end room. You should have a couple of bodies there and guys that can flex out and also play the fullback position for you as well. Kind of like what Max Mang became once Chris Elmore went out. Right. So, yeah, we'll see what happens in terms of the defensive line. That's definitely a, a target and a looming question here as we get into the off season. Also, it's kind of worth noting that Vincent Reynolds is the dad of Eric Coley. I don't yeah. necessarily know what Eric Coley's plan is because he has been at Syracuse for what feels like forever, but I think he does have another year if he wanted to come back. He wasn't a super senior by definition. So um, we'll see if, if that changes his, but I mean, basically when I look at the transfer portal, I think fans aren't really prepared for how crazy it's about to get. Yeah. We're probably going to see one or two names each day. I would even say this week because I did see Syracuse's leading power five competition with the 10 so far, but these other schools are going to catch up and right. They'll wait. I for mean, some, it's going to be a lot to wait for their bowl games to, to happen and all that stuff. Uh, again, I would say once you get to like new year's, you'll start to see things become hot and heavy and, and maybe right, even like but after- for Syracuse, it's this week probably because they don't have any bowl game concerns. I get what you're saying right. for the large, uh, but I'm saying context. like more, more players entering into the, the the talent pool as well. And again, at this point, you're kind of on the offensive with no bowl game. Like you're, you're full on recruiting right now. You also don't have a lot of players coming into your upcoming recruiting class. So you're going to have like, what's the scholarship number for football? 85. I want to say like, yeah, maybe you're lower, probably not like, I would almost be surprised if they get to 85. With the way that their roster is constructed right now, with the amount of players that left, with the lack of players that are coming in, unless they absolutely crush it in the transfer portal, I'd imagine they, they're going to find themselves with a tough time getting up to that 85 number next season. Because I'd imagine there's a couple more players that are probably on the way out too from oh, yeah, Syracuse. Definitely. So yeah, it, it'll be certainly interesting. I mean, a couple other coaching things that I do want to bring up too. Everyone else, who, so they mentioned that Ferry, Reynolds, Gilbert, out the door. Coming back, you've got Tony White, Mike Schmidt, Chip West. Everyone else's job right now is up in the air. The fact that Nick Monroe's name is not in the locks of coming back might be more laughable than your in-game management, Dino Babers. Like, ser- <laughs> like seriously, this guy brought in every single NFL prospect you have on your roster, and his job's well, up could in the that air? be he hasn't committed to coming back because he thinks he could go somewhere else. Maybe it, it might is. not be Syracuse say, and that's sort of how I but, vision, but you can say he's being retained. And then if he wants to go off and find a new job, like Tony white can go off and find a new job right now, just because Syracuse is quote unquote retaining him right now. Doesn't mean that he can't go off and find another job for himself. Yeah, but they came out and said specifically, Tony white will be back, which made me think, Oh, great news. Like he's not going anywhere else. So I think, but- Listen, I get what you're saying. You could say it, but in the, I think Mike Schmidt and Tony White and Dino sat down and they discussed, we're definitely coming back no matter what. So that's why they pinpointed those names. But here's the thing is like, you've got so many coaching jobs opening and the 
hirings are just starting to happen. Like you're telling me if Billy Napier called up Tony White right now and said, hey, why don't you come run your 335 down for me in Gainesville? You think Tony White's staying in Syracuse? Like there's so many yeah. good jobs out there right now and coaches that can be poached right now. I just, I wouldn't say it's set in stone per se that, that Tony White's coming back. I think that's the plan right now, but everyone has got a plan until you get punched in the face as Mike Tyson liked to say. So, right. No, that's a good point. I mean, Zach Garnett was committed to Syracuse yeah. or was hired by Syracuse for five days and then things changed quickly in this landscape. I think quarterback transfer is going to be interesting mm -hmm. going forward, whether they pursue that, how actively they pursue it. Obviously, Duke and David Cutcliffe have parted ways, and there's yeah. two guys right there that Riley Leonard, Henry Bellin. I'm not saying for next year, but you got to beef up the quarterback room at some point here, whether it's getting a recruit. You only have three scholarship guys in the quarterback room. You probably need one more, at least. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you should. I haven't really di di dive, dove, do dove, dove is my word dove. I'm looking for there. <laughs> um, I haven't really dove into the recruiting for 2022. I just know that there's 10 guys. I'd imagine one of them is not a quarterback. Uh, so I Yeah, they don't have a quarterback. There. So, yeah, yeah no, that's a problem to so. me. And, and I look at everything that, that's sort of – like there's so many questions because you still have some hires to make. You've got plenty of players to bring in. How about a special teams coordinator? I mean – Yeah, that, that's something too. That's well, something too. Like, the, Listen, I don't – I'm not going to pretend like I know the special teams coordinator market. I don't. All right. I, I think very few people do. You probably have to be inside that building and in football circles to understand who that guy might be and what constitutes a good special teams coordinator. All I know Does is this. Justin Lustick have a son. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding, but just someone that's tied to him because he worked out great. <laughs> yeah. And I think you look at the, the special teams coordinator for those who don't understand how important a special teams coordinator is. I mean, look at some of the best coaches in the NFL. They started out as special teams guys. Bill Belichick, John Harbaugh, both got their start as special teams guys. They're the guys that, people don't realize this, but in the NFL, a special teams coordinator is in every single meeting. They meet with the offense, the defense, and the special teams. They're the only people, aside from the head coach, that can say that. And that just shows the importance of it. It's like, why do you think the fill-in coaches, like in the NFL, we saw Cliff Kingsbury and Matt Nagy both miss games because of COVID. Why do you think the special teams coordinators are the ones that take the post? Mike McCarthy is going to miss this team, this upcoming game with uh, with COVID. Why do you think the 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 long the fifteen year long snapper is the guy that's going to fill in for his post this this week? Like special yeah. teams coordinators matter, and they're a part of the the blood of everything. And when you talk about a lack of discipline, if you've got a guy who preaches discipline and is in every single meeting room, you're going to see those penalties go down. Yep. All right, well, we will cut it there for our first football podcast, at least of the week. And I'm sure there's going to be more news in the transfer portal, offseason, all that stuff. We'll be keeping you guys updated tomorrow on the show. We will get you ready for Indiana. Huge game inside the Dome, yep. ACC Big Ten Challenge. A lot on the line for this one. Maybe not a must win, but maybe a can't lose. Feels like Syracuse really needs to right the ship after Atlantis. Trace Jackson Davis scored 43 the other day, so we'll, we'll break Good down luck. the matchup and... Yeah, it's, it's going to be intriguing. It's going to be another tough test for the Orange as part of this tough non-conference, but we'll give our picks, prop shop, all that stuff. Maybe even sneak in some DeBundo's digits for you tomorrow on the show, and we'll have that for you right in your podcast feed early tomorrow morning. So be on the lookout for that. Subscribe if you haven't already. Check us out on YouTube as well, and we'll talk to you guys then.